Hey, Badminton community, it's Henry and Jeff from the Badminton Podcast and Volant. Welcome to episode 10 of the Tokyo 2020 show, where we give you the latest news, results, opinions, predictions, polls, and more. So, Jeff, we had a pretty exciting day yesterday. Tell us what happened. Yeah, so we did have a medal ceremony yesterday, late last night. We had the men's doubles medal ceremony. It was quite funny because when they were presenting the medals, they just held it out as a tray like this with all the medals on them. And we were just rooting for someone just to take that gold medal that wasn't theirs and hang it around their necks. And we had, you had, they had to hang it around their partner's neck and then their mm. partner had to hang around their neck. It was a bit of an awkward situation, but it all worked out in the end. But I thought that was a bit funny when I saw it. Yeah, very, very awkward self-service uh, selection for, <laughs> for the award ceremony. Uh, but anyway, talking about yesterday, we had an all Chinese affair in the women's singles between Chen Yufei and Her Bing Zhao. Uh, we did see Chen Yufei take that in three sets, uh, which now brings their head-to-head -head from 4-2 to 4-3. So she's got one back, hasn't she? Yeah, she has yeah. got one back, and what a time to do it, right? At the Olympics. Yeah, I felt that in that third set, she just switched it on. Like mm. Yufei just started increasing the speed. Um, she started making those attacks account a lot more, and, and Bing Zhao just couldn't keep up. And that third set was pretty comfortable once Yufei got that momentum and that speed up. Yeah, I think that the aggressive play that she should have brought early in the game um, only came out right at the end, but perhaps that was a physical, uh, I guess, limitation. Perhaps if she actually went hard in the first or, or second set, she might not have you know, been able to carry that through throughout the entire game, because I think she was struggling a little bit from a physical side of things, so I, I definitely need to watch that going forward for her. Okay, I disagree, Henry, okay. respectfully. That's I don't okay. think she was physically in, uh, like tired or anything like mm. that. I think that there was just more she just didn't do it. Mm. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully she wasn't tired because she did, does have a, a final yeah. uh, a gold medal match to play tonight. Yeah, well, did she also had that medical break in between the matches oh, yeah, as well. True. So let's let's see what how that plays out in mm -hmm. the final, shall we? Yep. Yep. Um, and we also had PV Sindhu versus Tai Su Ying as well. What did you think of that? Yeah, look, I felt that Tai Su Ying got into the match a lot quicker than she did against Ratchanok. Uh, maybe for the f first half a set or so, she was making quite a few errors, like smash errors, half smash errors, net errors that we don't usually see when she's playing confidently. Mm. But she got into it and she started to kind of twist Sindhu in the four corners. So rather than playing around her body, just like deep backhand, um, really close to the net forehand and just pushing her around the court. And all of a sudden these holes started to open up. And when that happened, she got her confidence back. She was able to play her shots, take over the net. And it was, I think it was relatively comfortable after she found that strategy because we all know Tai Ying, right? She's, she's got all of the technique you could possibly want in the entire world. Her footwork, her racket work, her shots, her choice of shots, um, fitness, everything. Physique, speed, power. But it's just really the confidence and the, the mental strength, I feel, that is her biggest letdown sometimes. And when that's not switched on, then everything else can't work for her. Yeah, and I did. we did see that with, with her game against Ratchanok. And I think for her game against PV, Sindhu, it just... Um, it, it took her a little bit less time to find mm -hmm. that confidence. So rather than a game and a half, it was really just the first half of the game where, you know, as you said, those, those simple shots, the unforced errors were quite evident in, in her play. But once she was managed, once she managed to find confidence in herself, mm -hmm. you started to see um, her just essentially take control of the match and, and push Sindhu around. Yeah. And I think another thing with Sindhu when she played against Yamaguchi was she was able to take that con net, net control, but we didn't really see that against Tai Si Ying at all. Maybe she's a bit afraid of Tai Si Ying's variation at net, so she didn't want to give her that chance. But I think that against Yamaguchi, that was a really important part of her game. Yeah, and I, and I would have liked to see Sindhu do more of that, especially when Tai Su Ying is feeling less confident mm. early in the game, and then, you know, PV Sindhu could build on her confidence, uh, and, and I think that would have been a lot tougher for Tai Su Ying if that did happen. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So now we're looking at the bronze medal match between um, her Bing Zhao versus PV Sindhu. Mm. Um, their head-to-head -head is nine to six, so Bing Zhao is up in that head-to-head, -head. Mm. Um, and she did win the last Last one. Oh, sorry. PV Sindhu won the last one though. Yep. But the prior four times, uh, Bing Zhao won those four times previous to that. Mm. What are your thoughts on that one? To be honest, I feel like, like we said, with with PV Sindhu played that similar sort of net, net sort of. Sort of 
captured the net in the way that she did against Yamaguchi the other day, Bing Zhao's gonna have a lot of trouble. But if she doesn't do that, I'm actually thinking Bing Zhao would be able to take it just because she's going to be able to push her around the court uh, a bit more uh, and, and probably play a similar role to Tai Su Ying yesterday against PV Sindhu. So I'm actually gonna go Bing Zhao for this one. Sure. Same. I'm going to go Bing Zhao. I think that she's looking physically fitter mm. than Sindhu. Even though Sindhu's in really good shape, but Bing Zhao, I think, has improved her fitness significantly. And I do think that if, you can, if she can get into a longer game, then definitely PV Sindhu will struggle. Um, but, yeah, if she can take the net, in, in PV Sindhu can take the net and attack, then that, that's her best chance. I think the shorter the match goes, the better for PV Sindhu. Yeah, mm. no, I, I agree as well. So what about Tai Su Ying Chen Yufei? Hmm, look, this is a tricky one. I think that Tai Su Ying will be coming off a pretty like pretty confident after the last two wins against Ratchanok and PV Sindhu. If she can execute from the word go at love all first set, I do think that she'll have the upper hand and the head-to-head -head says it all, right? So she's up 15-3 in the head-to-heads. So I'm probably gonna go Tai Su Ying. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let, let's leave it there. Yep. Yeah. All right. That's fine. I think 15-3 is a pretty big psychological advantage. But if if history goes, you know, says anything about this Olympics, is that the, it doesn't really matter. It's the opposite uh, so way. I that's think. the thing. I, I guess what concerns me about uh, Yufei is firstly the the medical side of things that she did take a medical break a medical break in her last game, and that I thought that she was struggling a bit physically when she did play, you know, her her aggressive style mm -hmm. game, which is she's going to need to play Tai Su Ying. Um, so again. It, it does ride on Tai Su Ying's uh, confidence level. I think the most of her games we can see that once her confidence level is high, she has the physical, technical ability to beat her opponents. Um, so I'm actually going to go Tai Su Ying for this one. But yeah, I guess the, the big call out is how she's going to go, you know, start the game. Um, yep. Is it going to be one and a half set, one and a half games? Is it going to be half a game? How long will it take her to be confident? Will she be confident from the word go? Mm -hmm. Yep, and that, of course, for Chinese Taipei fans is huge because a second gold medal for them potentially, mm -hmm. if she does perform her best. Yes, especially when, when Chinese Taipei haven't won um, a medal in badminton before this year, and they mm -hmm. firstly uh, won their first medal, and it's a gold medal, uh, with the men's doubles yesterday with Liang Wang Chi Lin uh, versus the Twin Towers. Uh, so that was pretty exciting as well. What yeah, did that, you think? that was awesome. I think that they did bring that confidence from the Asan Seti One match the day before, but they didn't bring it at the start. I think they were quite nervous to start. Um, they, I think it was, they were down in the first set mm. and then they, they did come back. But once they started to win those flat, fast exchanges with the Chinese, mm. I think that was the turning point. So once they started to find that rhythm, find that kind of service situation where they just like literally serve, return third shot, maybe fourth and fifth shot, and that's it. Just, just out power, out, just out speed, outspeed them mm. um, then I think that they they gained a lot of confidence there and then with the Chinese I don't think that they're used to being challenged in that way in the fast game they're so used to being faster than everyone mm. and I don't think they were able to say okay we're not going to win this fast game let's yeah. block it to the side let's find the gaps or go over they, they didn't, didn't really do that they that. just oh I'm just going to drive harder if they drive at me I drive harder and the, the Taipei pair were just so ready for that yeah. that they I think China just dug themselves into a hole where they just couldn't get out of because they just kept trying to challenge in the flat game yeah they didn't really have any other options because I guess the flat game is their game yeah and it's like, well, if I change it to a blocking game, I'm going to lose that as well, uh, because that's not our style. Uh, and be, so they were being beaten at their own game, essentially. Yeah. Um, so Chinese Taipei was pretty much unplayable, similar to the situation last last night. Of yeah. course, the it Chinese just... were a bit faster mm -hmm. than than Asan uh, and Setia one, but you know that once they once they were able to get their string of points after the mid game interval in that first set. They were unplayable again. Yeah, yeah. It's just like they're teleporting to the shuttle. It, it, yeah, it didn't really matter who was hitting the shuttle. They would just it'd be the perfect shot. Yeah, yeah. And I think one Chilean with that brutal smash of his, he mm. he um broke I think three strings and three one strings, frame one or racket, something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something brutal like that. So let's hear from the gold medalists on their on their journey as to how they felt after that gold medal victory in the post-game press conference. When we started the first time in India, we lost. Actually, we were actually pretty disappointed. Because we thought it was enough. But we just wanted to say to Liang that we had to finish the rest of the game. But we didn't expect to fall and go to this step. So thank you very much for watching. When we started the goal, we hoped that we could stand together and fight for the gold medal. 
奥运这个殿堂，然后并且登上颁奖台。那只是今天很幸运能够在第一次打奥运就可以一起站在就是冠军的颁奖台上面。那 So of course we also had the bronze medal match yesterday uh, with Aaron Chia Sowuyik of Malaysia versus Indonesia's uh, Muhammad Hassan and Hendra Setiawan. That was tough to watch. Um, yeah. like, that was really hard to watch just because we're so used to seeing the daddies being so in control, so sharp. But after, I think it's after the coming off of that almost you know, annihilation yeah. from, from the Chinese Taipei pair the, the day before, uh, they just weren't really there. Yeah, I don't know mm. if confidence was down mm. and then maybe they were fatigued and physically tired as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we're just not used to seeing them just make so many er errors. Like when like Setia One was making quite a few errors just at the net, which we're, where we would never really see him make those errors at all. So mm. yeah, it was, it was definitely hard to watch. And I think that, yeah, the Malaysians brought the game to them. They didn't give them an easy game. They, they kept the pressure on as they, they, they should have and they did. And they were just able to capture that that advantage in them not playing so well. They didn't get dragged down with it. They just mm. rose above it. That they they played well, and I think they they did deserve that bronze medal. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think what we saw from uh, Hendra and, and Asan is just too many errors. And, and almost at one point, it was it was like Asan was carrying Hendra, and that's just not something that we would typically see of the daddies. Um, the daddies are so used to being in control, um, and Malaysia just didn't really give it mm. to them. So today we have a very special guest for you all. We have former Olympian Simon Archer, who once held the world record for the fastest smash at 162 miles per hour. He was known for his intelligence on court and was so dangerous that people feared him. He competed in both the 1996 and 2000 Olympic Games and won an Olympic bronze medal at the 2000 Olympic Games in mixed doubles with Joanne Good. He's also joining us from Portugal because he's on holidays at the moment. So thanks for joining us, Simon. First of all, tell us about the moment when you won the bronze medal. What was on your mind? First thing, good morning and uh, nice to speak to you. Um, uh, the bronze medal. I mean, we were so disappointed from the day before uh, when we failed to make the final. Um, so actually when the bronze medal came around and we had that opportunity, it was such a relief. Um, it, it was a really tight game against the Danish pair. Um, they had match points against us to win, just like we had match points uh, the day before. So um, anyone could have won. But I think once we got to uh, set in, um, in that final deciding game, then um, and we'd stop their match points, we, we sort of had a feeling within ourselves, the last two or three points, that we were going to get across the line. Um, and when we finally did, then I mean, all that emotion, all that release just, just came flooding out. Um, had family there with me uh, in, the, in the stands, which was amazing feeling. I think one of the big pluses for me was the, the uh, spectators and audience um, out there in Sydney was just unbelievable for the British athletes. I mean, we were like their second children, really, uh, behind Australians. Um, and it, 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 the whole experience was just amazing. Um, I, I can't fault the facilities and, and uh, the place and the venue. And, um, you know, it, it was a dream for, obviously, myself and I'm sure for Joe as well, um, you know, what we achieved. And, and, and you can see by the results and certainly by the results this time around, there's been so few Europeans have actually won medals at the Olympics. I think at the time we were the only the fourth pair to do it and the first uh, British athletes to do it. So it's really tough, really tough um, to try and get any any medal of any colour um, out there. So, yeah, absolutely ecstatic. Yeah, and I guess that, that makes it even more special when you are one of those kind of rare pairs or players that can win from Europe. But when, when you talk about the, the, the stand, obviously it's very different in Tokyo where there are no spectators due to COVID-19. And looking at, say, you, you talked about losing the semi-final, you had some match points, and then you had to play the next day. We saw that kind of happen in the men's doubles, or in all the events, but in the men's doubles, we saw uh, the Indonesian, the daddy, so Hendra Setia won, Mohamed Hassan, they lost their semi-final, and then they had to come back the next day to play the bronze medal match and lost that as well. And they didn't look like they were mentally that on top of it or confident. It doesn't happen in any other badminton event where you have to play the next day after losing a semi-final. So how did you manage that loss of the semi and then having to go into the bronze medal match? Like, what did you do in preparation? 
I think we just got lucky, to be honest. <laughs> I, I really feel for the Indonesians. I think going into the uh, semi-final, we were possibly the favourites in our, in our half of the draw as well. Um, I think the, the the main threat for the title, the um, South Korean pair of um, uh, uh, Ra and um, oh, uh, Kim, yeah, yeah Kim Dong, um, they they lost in the quarter final. So. Um, you know, the draw really opened up and we'd just beaten the Indonesian pair in the uh, Indonesian Open a couple of months prior to that. And they'd been on a, a five-year winning streak or something crazy like that out on their home patch and we'd just beaten them. So we were really confident going into that match. And I, I think it showed by the scores. We, we came out of the blocks firing in the semi-final and we, we got such a healthy lead that I think with today's scoring system, we wouldn't have lost. There's, there's no way we would have lost. But because of the old scoring system, you had to get a point. You had to be serving to get a point. It was still possible to have these big comebacks. Uh, and they did it in the second set. And uh, you, you've got to take your hats off to him, especially to Trickers, because he just decided just to start dominating the court, press forward like he can do. I mean, he's such a skillful athlete. Um, and, you know, he put the pressure on us and we had match points and uh, lost. And then... Um, in the third set, I actually strained my chest muscle as well. So um, we saw a new sort of later on in that third set, you know, it wasn't going to be our day. And that, but that was then really tough to take it through to the next day because I was carrying an injury. Myself and Joe didn't really speak to each other for 24 hours after that, <laughs> after being up in the match for so long and then obviously um, losing the way that we did. Um, so it was it was all really negative going into the next day. And, you know, I can feel for the Indonesian uh, doubles pair that actually probably going into the match being favourites um, and losing, it, it's really tough to bounce back. Um, we managed to do it. And, um, you know, it was an amazing feeling. I have to take my hats off to uh, Jo. She, she performed absolutely superb in that playoff match. I wasn't smashing hard for, I think, first hard smash I tried to do was about her about... 12 or 13 in the third set. I was just clipping the shuttle down and trying to keep it steep all the time. Um, but the Danish the Danish pair worked this out in the second set and they got on top of us through the second and third third set. You know, I mean, we, we, we came out of uh, the blocks really well in that first set. And But once they worked us out and realised that I couldn't hit hard, then uh, we, were, we were really up against it. And Joe played absolutely fantastic that day. Yeah, well, we, we know that she, she did and, and so did you So because you did win that bronze medal. And in yeah. terms of, I guess, winning the Olympic medal, what's life like after you actually claim an Olympic medal? Well, I, I think it, it varies. I mean, in the UK, badminton is still a, a minority sport. So, um, you know, if, if maybe I'd have been from one of the other countries, then, you know, we may be... Uh, have celebrated in, in a different fashion. I mean, you've only you know, got to look at someone like Kevin Gordon, uh, Guatemala, uh, in the semi-final. You know, if he manages to take a medal, then that would be unheard of. And, you know, he may be hailed as a champion for the next 50, 100 years. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But uh, in the UK, being a minority sport, um, life pretty much back to normal. It takes a, a month or two to sort of get over the... the the high and the buzz that you've, you've just achieved a, a lifetime goal. But then you all, all of a sudden you realise actually, you know what, I'm still a badminton player. Um, I'm still travelling around the, the world, playing tournaments. I've got to prepare for my next events. And, you, and you've just got to get back on that circuit or like I say, get back on that horse and just keep on rolling. And, um, you know, it, it, it raises your profile in the UK. Um, it certainly raised the profile of badminton in the UK, uh, what me and Joe did. Um, obviously, four years later, Nathan and Gail did um, one better and they went and got the silver, which was fantastic as well. So badminton got a bit of a, a, a jump and a, a lift around that period in 2000, 2004. But it has to be followed up year after year. And, um, you know, now, hey, look, I'm just uh, just an old man <laughs> like uh, many other ex badminton guys out there, same as everybody else now. But, uh, you know... I, it's an amazing, amazing experience and, uh, you know, something that will live with me for the rest of my life. Absolutely. It is an amazing achievement. Um, Simon, thank you so much for coming on on your holiday. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Good to speak. So let's recap on the matches that just happened just this afternoon. We had the men's singles semifinals. First one, we had Kevin Cordon, Guatemala.
Good job, versus man. Victor Axelsen Denmark. Mm. What did you think about that? We talked about this yesterday about Victor and how he was so fierce on court when he came to play uh, Shi Yichi uh, of China and he was just so dominant, he did nothing wrong, could control the drift and there was there was just this fierceness and, and just edge um, that we could see him in. But today he just wasn't quite as focused and I don't think I saw it throughout the entire match, although the score would suggest otherwise. Yeah, look. Yesterday we talked about Victor having a few different things, right? Or two different things. Mm. The laser eyes where it's like piercing, like he's going to kill someone with these eyes of mm. his. I didn't see that today. I, I wouldn't say that he was scared, but I saw a more tentative look in the eyes for the whole match today. And I found that he wasn't really taking that much initiative. Whether that mm. was a tactic or not, I'm not sure. But he wasn't really taking that initiative like he did against Shiu Chi, especially in the rear court, going for his rear court shots, changing the pace. He was more mm. just following, feeding, and it did feel a bit more tentative for me. Mm. I think that Kevin played well to draw him into that. Of course, Kevin is the underdog again, so he can play freely, and Victor's very, very heavy favourite, right? So maybe that has dawned on him, but that's probably the, the match that has... It hasn't made me waver as to think Victor's going to win gold, but mm. it kind of just puts that doubt in my mind. Maybe there is an element of that pressure coming to get him now, mm. but we haven't seen that previously. Yeah, I agree. I think that in his previous matches, he just didn't have that kind of pressure. And today, it, it was quite obvious that he was starting to feel something. Um, as to whether or not he'll overcome that in, in his next match, of course, for the gold medal, mm -hmm. uh, is, an, is another story, right? Mm. So uh, it will be very interesting to see, see how he performs uh, on, with the big match. Yeah, yeah. And I think another thing was once he did win that first set, though, we could mm. see a bit more confidence. I'm not saying that he was completely scared. Mm. I'm just thinking when he won that first set, then he gets to play against the drift in the second set. A bit easier to control. He can play four corners more. Yeah. Then he was able to take the net and predict Kevin a little bit towards the front court. Yeah. And then from there, he, he was in control of the mm. second set. He was in control, but definitely playing, even though he did play a little bit more aggressively, still safe. When yeah, he was a bit playing. safer. Yeah. Yeah. Not aiming, not really going for the lines, but really trying to place it in yeah. the court. Maybe this is a really smart idea, mm. just so yeah, that perhaps. he can be sure. Because mm -hmm. if he can play that game for long enough, he will, with the amount of pressure he can put on Kevin, he will eventually win, I think. Yep. But maybe that was the tactic. Yes, yep. possibly. Mm -hmm. yep. But look, we, we did have a lot of support for Kevin mm. um, in just in the general badminton community. In, in Australia here, there's so many people just rooting for Kevin because he's a fantastic story to tell. And definitely back home in Guatemala. And there's been lots of videos come in for him. So let's take a quick look at all the support and love he's been receiving back home. Vamos a seguir zurdo. Vamos con todo. Vos podés. Vamos zurdo. Vamos. Vamos Guatemala. Guatemala está con vos. Felicitaciones. Vamos Kevin. Vamos zurdo. Vamos. Vos podés con todo. Arriba Guate. Guatemala podemos hacerlo. Vamos papá. Felicitaciones Kevin. Vamos con todo. Vamos Kevin. Tu corazón es grande y todos nuestros corazones están contigo. Henry, I can't speak Spanish, but mm. that all of that sounded like it was really supportive and now really pumped for him. So he does have a bronze medal match now against Anthony Ginting because he did lose mm. against Chen Long today. Let's go through that first. What did you see in that match against Chen Long? Chen Long, in the, in the entire Olympics so far, he has been able to control his shots regardless of which side he's on. As far as all the molder players that we've seen so far in, in the singles category, he's been able to control the length of his shots so well. And he was in the game against Ginting. He was just able to neutralize any attack that Ginting was throwing towards him. And I think it just it was so much effort for Ginting to actually gain a yeah, point. Yeah. Like Ginting will be going flat out attack, mm. um, spin net, smash or half smash, but then he was just absorbing it. He mm. just had like a, a web. Mm. It was like a spider web he's he's obviously a lot bigger than Ginting but it mm. just like he just he, Ginting was just caught in his web and mm. he'd just be able to get everything and it was just kind of moving Ginting around as he pleased yeah. and I think that yeah that that form's really scary to, to see Chen Long playing that good form and yeah. that much control and then I think in the second he really found his attack especially that cross court attack mm. um, half smash slash smash yeah. from the around the head side he was winning back a lot around the head side yeah to, to Ginting um, mm. Ginting's Backhand, Back front inside. Yeah, yeah, front corner. Uh, yeah, it was, it was such a steep attack uh, as well. Um, and I think for, for Chen Long that 
being such a late stage of the tournament, he, just so composed. Yeah. Just didn't didn't seem like he had any pressure. Maybe it was the bananas that he keeps eating if, if sort of mid-interval. You're, you're convinced that those bananas contain something in there. That something great. Whenever he great. has that banana in the, the mid-game interval or between the sets, he just dominates the next set. So. Yeah, but to be fair, I don't I didn't see him eat a banana today, so maybe he no. was comfortable. <laughs> but I know in that, that second set that his confidence just kept building and when Ginting was challenging him, him at the net, he was just playing a net back to him. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, all right, so in terms of yesterday's quote, we had, if you just listen carefully, I just used all my power, I don't have anything else, I kept smashing. So the options were A, Li Junhui, B, Jia Yifan, C, Wang Qilin, and D, Kong Hyong. We had about 12,000 votes for this, with 66% voting for the correct answer, which was C, Wang Qilin. So well done if you've got that correct, but I do think that after his display in the last two matches, he can do a hell of a lot more than just smash. Yeah. There's mid court, front court, service situation, return. He can do everything. He was amazing. Mm, yeah. Absolutely amazing. As long as he's hitting it down. Or even no, he wasn't just hitting no, just it down. Right? Hitting just down. anything Defense. he was doing, everything. He had the Midas touch. That's exactly what happened. Um, so, in terms of the new poll, speaking of Kevin Cordon earlier, the biggest underdog story in badminton this year uh, from Guatemala. Listeners, where is Guatemala? So you will see a map on screen right now. You have four options, A, B, C, and D. Where is Guatemala? So for our Razor Racket for this episode, episode number 10, we did want to raise a racket to Wang Chilin Liang for their awesome performances in the semifinals and the finals of the men's doubles event, winning gold, of course, but we've already raise the racket to them. Yeah. So we, we really do want to share the love and we want to raise the racket to the bronze medalists. So Aaron Chia, Suibu Yik from Malaysia. You did Malaysia proud, definitely. Uh, you played well, you lost to Asan and uh, Setia one in the group stage. You were mm -hmm. able to win the bronze medal match. So raise the racket to you. Malaysia Bole. All right, so just a reminder of when the games start tonight. So tonight we're looking at 8.30 p.m. Uh, for the women's singles bronze and gold medal match that is Tokyo or local time uh, and then tomorrow afternoon at 1 p.m. for the women's doubles uh, bronze and gold medal match. So if you, you're still struggling to keep up to date with all the latest information you can check the screen right now there are three URLs that you can use to stay up to date and to see whether your favorite players make it through or not. So thanks for tuning in to the second last episode of the Tokyo 2020 show. We'll see you tomorrow for our last episode. See you then.